So thank you, Tim, and thank you uh, to the organisers for inviting me. It's a real honour um, to be here today. I'm going to talk um, about a collaborative approach to meta-science. So for those of you that don't know me, I thought I'd give a bit of an introduction. Um, I, not too long ago, became a professor of meta-science and translational medicine, and this is my first talk um, as a professor, so it's very exciting to be... <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting that it's at this meeting. Um, I'm a preclinical meta-research scientist. Um, essentially, um, our focus is on preclinical models of human diseases, so and how they translate to effective therapies and our increased understanding of human diseases um, in a clinical setting. So, translating what we see in a lab setting into humans. Um, I'm also a member of the Edinburgh Camarades team, and I'll go a bit more into Camarades. Um, and I'm a black female academic. So for those of you not familiar with Camarades, uh, this stands for the Collaborative Approach to Meta-Analysis and Review of Animal Data from Experimental Studies. And essentially what we do is we look systematically across um, the modelling of a range of different conditions. We came into this work um, very much focused on stroke research, but this has expanded, um, looking at a range of different conditions. Um, and it started off with us in Edinburgh um, and colleagues in Melbourne and Australia, and also expanded to now having six national coordinating centres uh, around the world. We, I used to spend a lot of time replying to emails and people saying, I'm trying to do a systematic review of animal studies. How do I do it? Um, so then we said, OK, why don't we have um, teleconferences every week so people could ask questions? This has now expanded um, into a kind of open drop-in session every week for people who drop in. Um, we have um, a retreat as well where we all try to get together and have some face-to-face -face time, uh, which I think is very important. And one of the things that came out of that has come out of our work in Camarades is this huge data repository. Um, this repository was hosted in Microsoft Access. Anyone who um, knows anything about data knows that that is not fit for purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it had data from about 19 different diseases, 7,000 studies, and over 200,000 animals. Um, I'll go into how that's evolved away from access in a bit. Um, but I wanted to start off with what our problem was, this translational problem that everything seemed to work in the laboratory and didn't work um, in humans. So these are data from colleagues in Australia back in 2006 who did a review looking at all the different interventions that had ever been tested in the model of stroke. There were over 1,000. 600 in animal models, 374 of those were shown to be effective in these models, just under 100 were tested in humans in a clinical setting, and then only one of these was effective um, in, in humans. There were a couple of, um, there are a couple of other interventions that are used clinically, but in stroke, you know, the data that comes from animals, that when I say translated, that's also quite a loose um, description. Um, there's only one intervention. So we had this problem with translational failure. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, I, you know, this is how we present our hypothesis, and I'm not sure that this kind of came later, our hypothesis, but essentially that we, we thought that they were some perverse incentives in the life sciences, things like publication bias, funding, promotion, to produce positive results with maybe not so much attention paid to their validity. This clearly is meta-science, but we weren't calling it meta-science at that time. Um, there wasn't, you know, that, this crowd... Um, we didn't have that language. Um, we also identified that in the use of animal models, we have all these additional pressures to reduce the number of animals that we are using because of cost, time, ethical considerations, feasibility. So then we have all these studies that are underpowered of unknown power, and then all these different factors um, combine to compromise the utility of animal models and contribute to translational failure. So our focus was really on some of these, what are the potential sources of bias that are leading to this or contributing to this translational failure. And we had four main areas that we focused our energies on. Um, the first being um, internal validity, so the strength of the cause-effect relationship, um, things like publication, uh, sorry, things like randomization and blinding, using you know, the use of those to improve the internal validity of studies. We're interested in generalizability, 
or the external validity of a study. So do the findings that we observe in a laboratory in an animal model, do they translate to other laboratories trying to do similar work um, to humans in a clinical setting, to different time points? Construct validity, are we really measuring what we think we're measuring? You know, does what we see in an animal, what we think is relevant to a human situation, truly relevant? And then publication bias. So are all the data that are being collected actually making it out into the public domain? And um, as I mentioned with Camarades, we've done all this work through the lens, really, of systematic review. So identifying all the relevant studies for that question, distilling it, you know, curating it into the systematic review, and then using th those data to, to answer our questions. And we found that biases were prevalent and they were important. So like I said, we started in stroke research, but our work has expanded across different um, disease areas. We've looked at motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, EAE, which is a model of MS, and glioma. Um, and we found the reporting of things like randomization and blinding um, was, was pretty low across the board. When we looked at the impact of this, um, it seems that this also has an effect on the outcomes that are observed. So these are data from one of our systematic reviews where we stratified studies according to those that do report randomization and those that don't. And we see studies that don't report randomization report much larger treatment effects than those that are considered to be of um, increased rigor. In terms of generalizability, um, the standardization fallacy um, is a concept that we worked with for some colleagues in Bern. And um, essentially, this, the efforts to increase reproducibility in studies by reducing variation by standard everything, so think standardizing everything, so things like ensuring that the lab environment is consistent all the time and that you use consistent tests and that you inbreed all these animals so that <laughs> there's very little genetic variation. What it's doing essentially is increasing the risk of detecting an effect with very low external validity um, or we're missing um, effects where there's high um, external validity. And um, a colleague of ours, um, Hanno Werbel, um, talks about the oh, sorry, talks about the um, reaction norm. So the effects that we observe are due to an interaction between our environment and the genetics. And depending on what other kind of nuisance variables are out there, you will observe an effect somewhere along this reaction norm. And it could be, I don't know, the radio is on, or somebody's got you know Chanel number five on, or something that causes a slightly different effect to be observed. Um, but what was happening is that we see, we do an experiment and we see an effect here and somebody else does a similar experiment and sees an effect here and we say we fail to reproduce. But actually, are we just sampling on different areas of um, the reaction norm? And to try and address this, we did some simulation work again with our colleagues in Bern um, where we looked at the concept of multi-center studies to increase heterogeneity. Um, and if we just focus on these two extremes here, the one lab study and the two lab studies, so each of these points are individual experiments. The red line is a line of no effect. This is the overall estimate when you pull these studies together, and this colored area here is the 95% confidence intervals of that effect. Um, we see in the single lab studies, some of the experiments don't overlap with a 95% confidence interval, suggesting that we fail to reproduce an effect. But in the multi-lab studies, all the experiments overlap with the pooled estimate, showing more consistency and reproducibility across the board. In terms of construct validity, um, I will go back to stroke. Um, so animal models that we use um, essentially are trying to capture aspects of diseases. You know, when we induce a stroke in a rat, it's not a mini-human. We're trying to... I guess, recapture part of that disease model. Um, and the outcome measures that we use are often surrogates. So in, in the stroke field, um, infarct size is, the, is the, the outcome that is generally used to see how effective your experiment was in an animal model, so how much of the brain is damaged. Whereas in humans in a clinical setting, we're more interested in daily activity. Can somebody get up in the morning, get washed, eat their breakfast, that kind of thing. So these are two different um, outcome measures. And there's some data that shows these actually don't correlate that well with each other. But then trying to do the daily activities in a rat is obviously, there's work in that space, but it's, it's much more complicated. Um, in stroke, time is also very important. Um, a 
call this the kind of tail of two drugs. We've got these two drugs, Terilizad and TPA. TPA is the intervention in the slide at the beginning where I showed the one intervention that worked clinically that had the animal data behind it. Terilizad is part of those 100 drugs that was tested in, in clinical trials and didn't work. When we went back and looked at the animal data and we looked at time, stroke time is very important. The animals um, in Terilizad were, test, were given the intervention about 10 minutes after they had a stroke. For TPA, it was about an hour and a half later. When we look at time to treatment in the clinical trials, for Terilizad, more than three quarters of the patients were given a drug more than three hours after they had a stroke. Whereas the TPA data is more consistent with the animal data. So is it that Terilizad doesn't work, or if you gave it to patients 10 minutes after they had a stroke, maybe would have more con consistency. Um, and then the final area of, of bias I was going to quickly focus on is publication bias. So these are data um, from the Camaradi's database, the famous access database, with lots of um, stroke experiments. Um, and essentially what we did is we used a funnel plot to try and um, look for publication bias. So on the x-axis, we've plotted the effect size for each of the individual experiments on this plot, each of these black dots are an individual experiment, against the precision, which is the inverse of the standard error. So the more precise the study is, the narrower the confidence interval. And what we expect with no publication bias is that you should have a kind of equal distribution at low precision of positive and negative studies. And as you become more precise, your studies should converge around the true effect. What we observed is a lack of imprecise negative studies in our data set, which is consistent with publication bias. And then we use a technique called trim and fill, which essentially tries to impute these theoretically missing studies so that your funnel plot is symmetrical, which are these red dots here. And when we did this, um, our overall effect was reduced from 32% down to 26%, and it estimates that about one in six experiments remain unpublished. Now, I think this is a gross, a huge underestimation of how big this problem is. Um, a lot of the studies in our data set, these negative studies, weren't truly negative publications. They were experiments that had some negative experiments, some papers, sorry, that had some negative experiments um, alongside some positive ones in the same, same paper. But it's not just systematic reviews um, that we do in, in the Camaradi's collaboration. Um, we have, these are two examples of some studies that we've done. The first was in collaboration with PLOS, the ICARA study, which was a randomized controlled trial um, looking at um, asking authors when they submit an animal study to submit uh, a checklist, the ARRIVE guidelines checklist, which is a reporting checklist, um, which unfortunately showed that asking authors to submit a checklist doesn't lead to improved reporting. Um, and then in collaboration with Nature, um, we've done an observational study where we looked at the impact um, of their editorial policy change, requiring authors to explain how they um, took measures to reduce risk of bias, if that also improved the reporting of their studies. Our work, um, I think, has had some impact, some positive impact. We don't just you know, look at people's work and tell them all the things that they've done wrong. Um, the purpose is to try and really improve the quality um, of the preclinical research that's been done. This is an example from a review that we did back in 2009 um, with a drug called interleukin-1 receptor antagonist in models of stroke. And we looked at the reporting of these measures to reduce risks of bias, so randomization, um, blinding, and sample size calculations. And as you can see, they, this is the proportion of studies that report um, these items, and very few studies report this. Um, one of the, the main PIs in this work, um, a colleague in Manchester, I was sitting next to him at a conference um, a few years later, and he says to me, you know, what, that really annoyed us when you did that. You know, it just really highlighted some of the issues. It was an unsolicited review of our work. We thought it was unfair because you didn't really understand the nuances. But then we stopped and we thought about it and realized if we don't tell people what we did, because their argument was that they did blind some of their experiments and they had done some sample size calculations, but because they hadn't reported it, it then reflected their light in, in a not, their work in a not so good light. Um, and he said it changed how they approached their work. And me, being me, 
said, okay, I'll have a look and check. <laughs> so <laughs> we, did, we did an updated review um, in 2016, and we see a massive increase in the reporting of these measures to reduce you know, risk of bias, which was a really positive and rewarding thing to see when your work is having some sort of impact. Um, some of the other impacts um, of, of our group um, has been around pushing robust design um, in experimental research. Um, working with the NC3Rs, we've had some input into the Experimental Design Assistant, which is an online tool um, to support researchers in designing their experiments well. Um, pushing for increased clarity of how studies were, have been performed, i.e. through reporting guidelines. The ICARA study led to um, or supported the revision of the ARRIVE guidelines. So there's now ARRIVE 2.0, which we were heavily involved in, um, and also the MDAR framework. Um, but also push for collaborative studies. Um, we led, I led the multi-part group, um, which was a, a collaboration to design the framework for multi-center preclinical experiments. And, was the impetus for the NIH-funded span, um, SPAN network, so for multi-center preclinical experiments. Um, and then I keep mentioning the famous Microsoft Access Database. Um, one of the things that we were very clear about was that we need improved infrastructure to, I guess, facilitate and support people doing high-quality systematic reviews going forward. So we developed the SURF um, platform, which is an online application to facilitate people doing preclinical systematic reviews. It allows the work to be done um, by large teams anywhere, you know, doesn't matter where you are. Um, it's got facilities to help people, you know, screen papers independently. You're blinded to other people's annotations when you're taking data out of, of papers, that kind of thing. And it's not in access. Um, and SURF is, is being used, which is great to see um, globally. We've got over 2,500 users now and 1,300 projects um, in the platform. So that kind of, all that talk, I guess, was um, trying to show you some of the work that we've done within Camarades. When I say we, it really is we. It's not just us in Edinburgh. Um, it's colleagues from around the world um, who've worked with us to, to, I think, create some really important and impactful research. Um, what I think some of the benefits of collaboration are, are certainly um, pooling resources and expertise. Um, I think this is particularly important in an evolving discipline. I said at the beginning that, you know, meta science wasn't a term that we used in what we were doing, even though that's what it was. We didn't have the language for it. It was very new. People weren't, there weren't very many preclinical systematic reviews out there. Um, so working with colleagues, you know, in for, you know, we relied heavily on the Cochrane collaboration, you know, the clini clinicians who were doing systematic reviews to get their expertise. Um, because it wasn't really a discipline, there weren't really resources out there. That, you know, there weren't dedicated pots of money to do, to do this work. Um, this screenshot is from our universities. So, faculty, we've got this online platform where when you're putting in grant applications, it goes through this system so you get all the costing and stuff. Um, and you can see that by far the majority of, of our applications um, have been unsuccessful. And this actually makes things look a lot better than they are, because there's lots of things that we've put in that, you know, there's letters of intent at the beginning that you spend ages doing that don't go through this because you don't have the finance bit in it, aren't in here. So um, although I think we appear relatively successful, it really is an uphill struggle, and it has been very difficult to get to identif just identifying pots of money that you can apply for and then... Um, and then writing those grants and actually getting the money. Um, learning from other disciplines. Um, I often talk about when we, some of the reviews that we've done, um, especially in, in the preclinical space, you often have a lot, there's lots of studies. You know, we've got systematic reviews that have got thousands of papers in them. And we used to screen these papers manually, um, which, you know, clearly would take a huge amount of time. And I remember we had somebody who joined our team um, and she had a background in physics and just thought it was absolutely bonkers. She's like, why would you not just get a, an algorithm to do this? Why are you doing this manually? And it never even occurred to us back then that this is something that you could do. So learning from other disciplines um, has, has been tr transformative in how we do our research. Um, greater sample sizes, I think, is a given, and data diversity. 
Um, but also increased transparency and accountability. I think when you know that other people are going to see what you're doing, you, you think twice and you look and you double check your work, which I think increases the quality of what you're doing. As with all these things, they are challenges and limitations. Um, it, can be, it can be difficult coordinating large scale projects. Um, one thing that I've learned, I don't want to say the hard way, but you know, it has been challenging, is that different disciplines speak different languages. The same word can mean something very different between a data scientist and you know, a biologist, or when you speak to a statistician and you think you're all having the same conversation, but you're not at all. Um, and that, and I've, I often say, you know, I feel like, well, maybe you know, if science doesn't work, I can maybe go into dis diplomacy now, because I feel like I've learned a lot about how to speak to people who speak different languages. Um, time and resource constraints. Um, they are issues around funding across different jurisdictions. Um, we were at dinner the other night, and there was a big whinge about Brexit. This had a huge impact for us in the UK um, in terms of accessing... Um, it's not just about accessing the money. It's also how your, how your European colleagues, at least, you know, if, well, if we have a, European, a UK partner, it's a bit more difficult because, you know, now they've Brexit. So all these things have an impact in terms of how collaboration works. Um, I've spoken already about, you know, very few meta-science pots. I know for us, a lot of the work that we were doing was it wasn't funded work. It was alongside the work, you know, the neuroscience grants that we were writing. And then on the, on the side, we were doing these other meta-research, meta-science projects. Um, and they also can be a heterogeneity of motivations. You know, people from different areas have different, have different reasons that they want to do this. They're motivated by different things um, to do this work. And managing that can be challenging. And getting traction as well within a domain. So... Um, I think one of the things I often talk about with, within the stroke, and the example I gave earlier about you know, the colleague who talked about how our review changed how he wrote his papers, getting traction within the domain is really important. It's not useful for us to, like I say, keep telling people you're, doing, you're not doing it right, you're not doing it right, um, without actually getting their buy-in so that then it leads to them changing how they do what they do. So future, future directions and recommendations. Um, I think there's a real importance in terms of diversity and inclusivity in collaborative projects. And not just in terms of expertise. I think I've spoken a lot about that. Yes, you want people from different um, academic backgrounds and, and different expertise. But I think you also want a difference in people's backgrounds. You know, I talked about being a black female academic at the beginning. And in the years throughout my career, I feel like I've often been the only black female academic in a room. There's very... Um, there might be many more women now in, in the room when I sit in rooms and in collaborative projects, but very few women of colour or people of colour generally. So I think that's something that we, as, as a group, need to, I think, think about. And I saw that the next session, actually, is talking about um, equality and diversity. So it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that discussion. Incorporating emerging technologies and methodologies. Um, I, haven't, I didn't have time today to really go into some of the work that we've done to try and do that, apart from saying that we used to screen things manually and then now we use machine learning. Um, but my colleague, Caitlin, I was saying the other day as well that this meeting is a camaraderie sandwich I'm starting. My colleague, Caitlin's given the very last talk of the conference. Um, so hopefully you stay to, to hear that. But she's going to talk about some of the work that we're doing um, in terms of using machine learning um, algorithms and technologies to really step up how we do systematic reviews and things like making them living. And I think there's something around um, developing politi policies and incentives to enable collaboration. Um, there was, I remember at the start of my career, this, you know, the kind of the real focus on the winner takes all mentality and the kind of individualist, individualistic approach to academia. And I think that has definitely shifted. Um, but I think there's still a huge amount um, to do, and I think that is something that does differ, and something I've observed differs across different disciplines as well. So, some shiny new things. Um, I am just coming back from maternity leave, and I wrote three grants when I was pregnant, and all three got funded. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 
I'm trying to break it to my husband, but this is the key to my career, is, <laughs> <laughs> is writing some grants while I'm pregnant. Um, I won't go into details about these different projects, but these are the three projects that I'll be jumping back into um, when I'm back at work full time. But what I wanted to, to highlight is the, the collaborative nature of all of them. That's really been key to what we do. Um, it's, you know, different expertise in different countries. The iRISE um, collaboration is going to be presented a little bit later today with um, colleagues who have also had European Commission funded projects, um, Tier 2 and Osiris. Um, and we're going to talk about how, even though these are big collaborative projects, how these three big collaborative projects are also going to try and collaborate with each other. Um, and then this last one um, is interesting because we're also moving into this space of we're collaborating with people with lived experiences of the conditions that we're working in. So this is this project, this Galanos project, um, is focused on depression, anxiety, and psychosis. And we've got representative, representatives of people with these with these conditions in the project, which again I think is really important to ensure the work that we're doing is useful. I think what's helped has been finding our tribe. Um, Meta-science, meta I think, is now a discipline in its own right. Um, but before that, finding other people who had those interests, I think, has been really important. Finding your cheerleaders. And for us, those have come from different stakeholders. Um, working um, with people like PLOS and Nature, I think, has been really important for us. Um, face to face time, really taking time to develop relationships, I think is essential to effective collaborations. Um, I mentioned we have a camaraderie's retreat. I think this is, it works very well. Within that retreat, we also have a mentorship scheme to ensure that junior researchers are mentored um, and are supported in their careers. So, this is my last slide. In summary, um, we didn't know that we were doing meta science at the beginning. Um, we showed, at least in our discipline, that many studies were at risk of bias, and bias studies overinflate effect size. I think we've had some impact, um, which is, like I say, has been rewarding to see. Um, but I think the underlying, the un thing that I want to underline here is that collaboration has really been key to what we've done. So thank you all for listening, and to everyone who supported our work. So I think we have time for just maybe one, two questions, if anyone wants to go up there. Sorry. Presentation. And you mentioned bias and random error. How about our cognitive bias? How to tackle the psychological aspect of a scientist wanting positive results and not not exactly searching for the truth, but for positive results and publications. So how about our cognitive bias, which is natural of the human being? Um, it is, it's very natural. Um, and I think that's part, I think part of that is, you're right, it's natural. I think it's interesting, it's exciting. You want to see positive, you want to show positive things, you want things to work. In terms of how you, you tackle that, um, that's definitely beyond my expertise. <laughs> um, I think I would, I would hazard a guess that the incentives, I think, will make a big difference. You know, how you incentivize this stuff, I think, would make a huge difference. Um, because as much as we want to just do the things that we like doing, you also kind of have to put your big boy pants on, essentially, and, and do the things that you don't like doing because they're important and, and essential. But how you go about that, I think that's definitely beyond my, my expertise. This. Um, Manu Baker from uh, Issues in Science and Technology. Uh, I know there's been some efforts to um, have animal registries for pre-registration specifically for animal studies, and I'm just wondering how feasible you think that, uh, that is and how, um, how useful it will be for surfacing some of the unpublished work. So they do exist, actually. I'm, I'm aware of two. Um, in Germany, there's the BF, BFR have, have one, um, and there's the preclinical trials or EU as well. Um, I think part of it's a cultural issue in that, you know, we do, animal scientists haven't traditionally 
pre-register their studies. Um, but they are, I think it's one of these movements, isn't it? You get the early adopters. Um, I think there's a thing around incentivizing it. Um, some of the arguments around that have been the nature of some of the studies. You know, if you're doing a confirmatory experiment and you've got very clear hypothesis-driven study, then it's very, you can see how you'd pre-register that. I think some of this kind of blue sky exploratory stuff, people are a bit more concerned about how you would do that and how it would work. So I think there might be some kinks to iron out, but I think it's feasible and I think it would have an impact in terms of being aware of what's been done. And it would also sign kind of to the question before um, around being aware that these experiments have been done without necessarily having to then write a full paper about something that you maybe hasn't, hasn't worked, not because it hasn't worked because it's, you haven't got the, the, the result you wanted, but it hasn't worked because for technical issues or for you know, some other reasons. So I think there is, there is, I'm a, a supporter of pre-registering animal studies for sure. I think there is potential for impact. Awesome. One more round of applause.